And I'll share the screen with you. So um, I've got a gridded version here, which may be of some help to you. Um, so I'm going to try using the grid method this evening because actually the important aspect of this particular drawing class is I think getting form and understanding these rather difficult ellipses. So when we look at an object such as a lemon, we, we know it's a round thing and it wouldn't matter if it was a jug, a bell or an apple or anything that's round a football, it doesn't really matter. Um, when we turn it to its side, we see the other plane. So there's a circle. So that's what the lemon looks like from the front or the back. And then if we cleave the lemon in half, then it opens the doorway. So that would be a full silhouette from the side. But if we then cleave it, we've got that silhouette, but we're turning it almost three quarters to one side. So if we're losing a quarter. Here we are then almost turning it halfway. So we're seeing an ellipsoid turning away from us gradually. And then the last, we have ever decreasing shapes of ellipsoid until it's almost side view on the, the um, circular form. At that point, it's like a coin. You know, you can imagine a coin. The, this could be coins. Um, and um, it's getting those ellipsoid circles into, or shapes, if you like, into perspective. So that will be our job with this one. There is also um, the conceptual idea of the circular form on the jug, because each aspect of the jug is curvilinear. So we've got to kind of try to imagine how we're going to use this idea of these circular planes, if you like, uh, within the um, rendering. So pl plenty of information, uh, plenty to get our teeth into in this one and to make us think about this. Also, one last thing before I get into the drawing. Um, the way the light is affecting this, the light is coming from the left. You can see that with the terminator here, even on a light blue object, you still get a shadow that's, you know, it's definitely darker this side than this side. Um, and if we look at the shadow here on the table, we can actually get an idea. Look, there's the Terminator there. And you can see that the Terminator joins up with the, the cast shadow there. So this all becomes a shadowy shape. And that lemon there, this is a great exercise in color as well, but I, I'll probably not be visiting it in color. But all of that there and all of that there is locked in and unified as a shadow shape. Pretty much the same with the lemon here that's sliced. It has its own little shadow shape, which gets lost amongst the shadow shapes actually on the jug. But I believe that little shadow shape there comes from that lemon there. So that tells me the direction of the light is like so, coming down from that kind of an angle there. Okay, so that's worth um, seeing and understanding. Um, and it's possible as well that the, the light source is coming a little bit over in that direction over there. So as I draw this arrow, hopefully this will start to make a little bit more sense. So the back of that arrow is further over that way. And the front of this arrow is slightly further towards us. So the arrow is pointing that the light is actually pointing that way. You can see it with the 
cusps on the shadows. So with that in mind, we can now start to block out the uh, exercise ready for shading. Now, I can't remember if I said to you, bring um, charcoal or pencils for this one. It doesn't matter. If you've got charcoal, it'll still work. Uh, and if you've got pencils, it'll definitely work, but a little bit more slowly. Any questions so far about um, the observation? I didn't mention the reflections in the surface of the varnished wood. Um, I'll probably talk about that later, depending on how we get, how far we get within the next couple of hours. Okay. So where do we begin? Right. Well, I'm going to share another screen now because I'm going to uh, share my view as well. And I'm going to draw this out as a grid, like I said. So here's my page. It's an A3 sheet. And because it's A3, that means I can have 10 centimeter steps on these three by four grids. So all I have to do, therefore, if I've got a big enough ruler, which luckily I have, I'll just mark out my 10 centimeter Intervals, both sides of the page. Now, if you're if you're using your a photocopied sheet, you could draw on your photocopied sheet first of all. That will help you. Uh, then you don't have to work from my screen exclusively. So you could be drawing this grid on your photocopied sheet. Now, if your photocopied sheet is A4, which it's likely to be, then divide it by three, you'll probably find, I can't remember if it's five or six centimeters, but if you divide it, you'll see. It might be seven centimeters by, I just can't remember, sorry. <laughs> but on A3, it's, it's uh, 10 centimeters intervals. And going this way, it's the same as well. I've got intervals of 10, 20, 30, and that last one, the 40, you'll end up with a small amount spare, but I just include that as the background. So hope that makes sense. Now the gridding out method, um, a lot of artists use this method. It's a, it's a very old time proven uh, successful method. But my advice to you is, don't go beyond three by four. 12 is enough boxes on any um, size composition. Um, there's lots of apps out there which will convert any picture like that picture I've converted there with the red lines for its grids. Um, I do know some artists will do hundreds of squares for whatever reason to get more accuracy, I guess. And then it becomes like a jigsaw puzzle, which square is which. And we really struggle after the number 11 cognitively uh, when we're comparing. So 12 is just within it, I think will be okay. Um, I certainly struggle after that size. So I sometimes go three by six. So I, that's my preferred size or my uh, format for my grid. That could easily be the same as this. But I thought I'd scale it up a little bit because actually it does give you more. Um, it will give you more, a little more accuracy. So, yeah, the more grids you put in, in theory, the more accurate it will be. But at the end of the day, it's, it's like going from a hundred piece jigsaw to a thousand piece. It just takes much more time. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so where do we begin? Well, we usually begin either with the horizon or the separation of the air and the ground or the water and the land, whichever, whichever features in, in the scene. Um, for us, our first job is this horizon line. What becomes it 
effectively, which is that green line I'm bringing now, which is the back of the tabletop. So that would be roughly three quarters of the way up on this first box at the bottom. So you can even use a ruler. There's no rules to say you can't. We've used a ruler for the grid. There we are. So there's my, it's very safe. I've got a nice straight line for the back of the table there. Once I've got that established, then I go for the biggest shape next. So the biggest shape next, of course, is the turquoise blue, very light blue jug, which is a lovely color for a painting. Anyway, so what I'm doing now is I'm making its shape and its basic shape, if we really look at it, we can break it into three parts. The bottom part, which is like, a, reminds me of one of those, um, I don't know, like, um, like um, an eggplant or something, one of those legumes. And if we start with that shape and we can identify where it comes to, it comes to the top of that line there. And it does cross this line here. So we're looking at right hand side box and the one next to it. It may help you. It will certainly help me to establish a, a line of symmetry through the, the shape, which I estimate is there. So that can give you another line of inquiry. And you see, this is the thing, the grid is a starting point. You can make other grids within the grid. For example, I said, don't, don't go for a, you know, a bigger grid than you need. But here I am now dividing a little bit of that grid for my, uh, for my own benefit. And um, I've known artists as well who will grid out certain grids to more detail because that one box may have more detail within it. So yeah, that's, that's fine as well. So once you've established your line of symmetry, we can then move on from there. Right, so there's my line of symmetry. And now I'm going to try to establish this jug shape. Now there's two tilts, left and right, giving it the um, symmetry. So I would um, estimate that the first tilt, which is I'm going to put on the left, is about three or four minutes past the hour. So that gives me something definite to work with. And I just bring that down. Now for this example, as long as it's symmetrical, you know, it shouldn't be a big problem if we make the jug a little bit wider at the base or a little bit narrower, as long as it's symmetrical, that's the key. Because, you know, this is quite an unusual flask. Um, I've seen similar things. It's like the sort of thing you might find at Ikea or something, but it's not a regular one. So who's to know if it was, if it would be just a little bit different. Now, when I get to the bottom square here, I'm establishing, so this is my, remember this is the square. I know I put this horizon line in but it's about halfway of the original square. So forget the horizon line and just think it's about halfway that way. And then you've got that basic shape. That's good. That's a really good starting position because little by little, we chisel away until we have got all of the objects blocked in, and then we go into detail. Once we're into detail, we're not so far off rendering. 
So what's the next shape? Well, the next shape, it's not quite so easy, unfortunately, but if I use that pencil thing again, I could probably use a tilt here and a tilt. You see this tilt I'm gonna do here? It's, it's an envelope. And then from there, I'm going to take an envelope across. So it's a very basic box shape. Now, the tilt here that sits on the top of the neck or the collar of the jug is about two minutes past the hour. But the one that goes over to the uh, left, that goes out a little bit further. So this time, it's more like five or six minutes to the hour. And if we think about this square exclusively, we can see that the tilt begins a little bit lower than halfway down that square, a little bit, uh, maybe two fifths from the bottom up, two fifths, and then it tilts across at about 16 minutes past the hour. So you can see I've got my a kind of a basic shape now. And I'm looking at it and thinking, is that looking okay? And maybe I need to push out a little bit on this side. And perhaps that gives it a bit more symmetry. So each time you add an element, it then gives you a context. So we're never going to stop comparing. Um, that's the point of the artwork. It's uh, we're comparing what we can substitute for nature. And even when it's finally in the frame on the wall, people will be judging it. So this is your chance to get it looking and feeling like what we're seeing. Right, so now I've got that second part, I need the third element. Now the third element, I can't really help you with much. But it starts out as a C curve going outwards, uh, approximately one third this way on this square here. And then it takes its journey at a tilt all the way down and joins in just behind the lemon. So if we can get that curve here and it's one third in this square, you see what's happening? We're using sort of micro measurements within the square. Then I can also compare the top of the, the loop of the handle. It's slightly higher than the beak of the uh, spout. And then I've got to bring this tilt down. And what would you say that tilt is? I'm thinking it is about one minute past the hour, maybe two, somewhere in between, perhaps. So I bring that down like so. And already it's starting to have a comparatively similar feel. So hope that makes sense for you. And then once you've got those uh, basic shapes in, then you can start to be a bit more specific. Even at this stage, I can put a double edge, the inside edge to that handle. And you know, if I go a little bit short or a little bit lower or higher than where it joins in, who would know? I, d I doubt um, it would look wrong in either situation. So there we are, quite happy so far with that object. And I will, unless there's um, something in front of the object, I tend to then erase the lines within it. I don't need them anymore. I'm happy where that's going to be. And it clears the way for the shadow map. Now there is a lemon in front of it. We'll put the lemon in in a moment because funnily enough, it's the next big shape. But before I put that lemon in, I'll just get the curve to the uh, spout of the flask. Um, and for that, it's best if I get rid of those red lines so you can see it more clearly. There you go. So there's like, a, it's like um, an S curve. So from the lip, it goes upwards slightly and then it goes into an S 
sort of like a swan neck. It sort of goes down gracefully into a curve, slightly curving the other way, but almost joining the straight line that we had drawn the envelope into. So there we are. How to make a very complicated shape um, seem easy to draw. Or more straightforward. Yeah, I'm gonna try not to get into the, saying it's simple because nothing's simple. Even drawing a curve is not, or a straight line can be problematic. So, um, give you a moment with that, and then I'm going to start onto the lemon, because the lemon is in front. This is a smaller object, but it's bigger than, I think marginally bigger in surface area than the knife, and it's the biggest of the lemon objects. So, now with lemons, their natural forms, they are sort of symmetrical. There is a symmetry involved. This one sort of is split there, if that's the line of symmetry. So that wouldn't be a bad place to start. And then we can also use that for the, we can see it almost starts on the line, on the grid, and it ends just past halfway on that axis there. So that's good because we can now find the parameters. So that's about halfway on my square. I go a little bit further to the right, giving it a little bit more space to exist. And then I notice where it is in relationship to the other line, touching it. And also remember this horizon line, the table edge, it also just appears slightly above that. So this is when I use all my powers of drawing a curve, which are not very good. So I just do my best at arcing. And then this is where it gets difficult because we arc the other way. And I should say that on this axis, it's a little bit lower than half way down the square, more like three fifths of the way down. But nobody really likes fifths because it's an uncomfortable measurement. So think of it perhaps as just past halfway. And there it is. That's my attempt at the lemon shape. It's not too bad. I think it's about the right proportion. I'm happy enough with that. And then I erase where it eclipses the jug, which will help the jug to feel better already because... Now the jug's got something to hide behind. Now you, you'll notice that mine does seem to be tilting over and that's because there is, I've already consciously thought about that line there. And that is on a tilt, which is about 16 minutes past the hour. And that will help you to sort of tilt the lemon slightly or it can help sometimes because we now know that the back end which probably bulges a little bit more out and the front edge end that de definitely bulges out that you've got the little um, um, bit where it sort of joins onto the tree And now it certainly feels more like a lemon, which um, is good. I hope yours is too. And I just brush away the burrs at each stage because it just keeps your, uh, your paper tidy. Right. Um, So I'll give you some time there because obviously that, that was quite quick. Now the next big shape would be the either the knife 
or the lemon. But because we're getting into these uh, lemon shapes, I'm going to stick with the lemon. And the lemon that I'm going to be doing next is, you probably guessed, is that one there. And it's like um, a circle, it's pretty much a circle. It's being slightly eclipsed by the segment there, but I draw it as a full circle like so. And where is it in the, uh, the scheme of things? Well, it's on that center line coming down, third box down, <laughs> or one box up. And it's peeping over the left-hand grid line, a small amount. And I would estimate that a fraction of this box here, where it meets the table, is just above halfway. So there's the halfway line. You can kind of see where the halfway line is there. And this one is a little bit higher than halfway. So there's my halfway point. That's good. So now I'm really thinking about where it occupies on the picture plane, its space. And then I'd like you to think about its distance from the jug. So remember that you need to give it a little bit of breathing space from the jug before you get fully into drawing your circle. Um, there is another way of doing this as well. If you really struggle with circles, which actually most people who get into a drawing beginning really struggle with circles. So you can draw a cross. So if that helps, why not? So there's that's I'll change the color for this. I'll show you how you can turn the cross into a circle. So that's the length and height of the object so that's the cross so that would be it there literally the cross line goes through the table line or the horizon line so that's a clue and then arc each section as if it were like a pizza slice some people turn their sheet around beginners tend to do that some intermediates and some pros because it makes it comfortable for the arcs. But I would recommend that you try to learn this motor skill here. You're going to, instead of curving that way, just let Hillary in because she's struggling on the Zoom. So I'll just wait for Hillary to get in because she's just popped out again. I don't know whether it's my line it could be or whether it's Hillary's not sure I'll just pause just to see if Hillary's all right I'm recording so that's um, centralized my lemon it's given it a little bit of space between the uh, jug and itself So I'm quite happy with that lemon now. So I'll erase what's in between it. And then I move on to the next biggest lemon, which is the one that's slightly tipping over. Um, so that's my uh, strategy. I tend to just go, I'm, I'm a little bit religious about it because obviously as a teacher and instructor, um, I have to uh, find an easy way to deliver the information. So that's how I do it. Um, but there's no rule that says you have to do it this way. You can pick, as long as you put whatever you're drawing in the right place, it's fine. But the, the method is very logical if you think about it, because what's going to happen is as I chisel away metaphorically at the bigger objects, gradually there's less space 
and the smaller objects will find their own um, place. That's my interpretation of it. But of course, if you were to draw the smaller objects perfectly in their place, um, the big objects will fit in as well. So there is a sort of counter logic as well, but it's just easier to do bigger things. So for this lemon, my advice is that I've just drawn the line of um, perspective on it or what I'm perceiving it as, um, but I haven't drawn its perimeter as a square yet. So, because as I showed you with the last lemon, you can turn it into a, basically a cross or a square. So there it is, that's what it is. If I was to really Mondrian and cut that into an abstract shape, we could half that square, pretty much, just less than half that way. And then a little bit less than half this way, and you'll find where this one resides. And if you really want to get accurate with that, then that square there is one third away from that edge there. And then if you really want to get accurate again, you can then take one quarter of the way down. And that's how I know it sits in there. Now, to get its perspective, I've just put a tilt of a cross through there, which, again, it just so happens that the cross of the perspective should go through the, what I'm calling the horizon line, that table. So that's good because that gives you something else to control your drawing with. Anyway, that's what I see. And then I add to it because it's got this we'll clear off clear off the drawings again. You can see that there's like a cusp here, like um as if it were the moon. We have that side plane visible just a slither of it but enough to give us an understanding of what we're seeing here and that is sliced lemon and it's sitting on its end as it were so you give it a little bit of a cusp there and we've now got approximately three quarters of a circle for the ellipsoid shape there Remember, that's the full circle. So if we were to cut a third off, a quarter off, sorry, it would look something like that. So I'm happy with that now. And I can erase the central part. And remember that whenever you're drawing like this and you're getting you know, it's reasonably accurate using this method. You might want to stretch and push some of the boundaries a little bit as well, just to make it feel more like how you are interpreting it. Right, so where to next? Well, um, I would always go to the next big shape, like I say. So even though I can't see all of it, it is the sliced lemon that's actually on the table, lying flat with the other one sitting on top. And this one, I feel, begins its journey into the picture more of a rectangle. So you could start with a rectangular envelope for it. That makes it really easy. Or no, I shouldn't say that, makes it more simple. Oh, no, <laughs> I've missed one, haven't I? I'll come back to that one. Sorry, that is a rectangle. But we have this lemon slice here, sorry. Which we're now seeing probably two thirds. So that was three quarters. And now we're seeing two thirds of its circular plane. So that's tricky 
now I'm going to uh, attempt to draw a line through the center there to give it symmetry and then a line through the other side to give it perspective. Right, so where do we find that? Now, again, there's plenty of ways we could do this. We could turn it into a box to begin with. That's not a bad idea, funnily enough. And then from there, we can work into the circular shapes. So if we start with the box, it's the top of the box is just lower than the back of the table. The bottom of the box is just lower than the curvilinear base of the jug. So that's a good reference. And then the um, right-hand side of the box touches the jug just about, funnily enough. And the left-hand side of the box is very close to being in line with the center of the lemon behind. Very close indeed. So that's the box. And then within that box, we can now start to put our tilt lines. So the tilt line will go from that corner there. And if, if you look what I'm doing, I am drawing that tilt at 17 minutes past the hour. And then the other line crosses at about 12 minutes past the hour. And then just like I did before, I join the arcs of the cross to each other within that box shape, that rectangular shape. So I'll end up with an oval, like a rugby ball or an olive, but it's slightly tilting down to the right. And then once you have got that shape basically in, then adjust it by eye to what you're seeing, because using the box, using that little cross in the center there, they're just devices, strategies to get more accuracy. But as I said, once you've got the basic shape, then you adjust by eye. Like I need to push it out a little bit in the box there, just a little bit to give it more as if I'm inflating it, if it was a inflatable lemon shape. And then it needs the cusp, which just like this one here, it also has the cusp touching down on the ground below which is also within that box framework. So that's some strategies. They're, they range from beginner strategies through to more advanced strategies, but whatever you can use, use. And if anything confuses you, 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 know, you, you can leave it or ask me. I'll see if I can find another way of explaining it. But hopefully by the addition of those strategies, you're going to be able to then free draw that shape more accurately. So there we are. We have one, two, three, four lemon shapes. And now we're going to go back to the one I almost started that was a little bit too soon, but that's the rectangle here. So I'm going to use that box section again. Now, sometimes people get confused with these boxes because they, you know, it is sometimes new, to, especially to a beginner, to use this kind of a strategy. And you'd think, well, why would I want to, I could just draw the lemon shape. Yeah, you can, 
But sometimes just drawing the lemon shape will put it in the wrong, uh, the wrong height, the wrong scale, the wrong perspective. So this box is an attempt to get the scale or the proportion correct of the lemon. It's going to fit within that envelope. It's literally like an envelope, good old fashioned envelope. We used to put information, a letter inside of it. It would fit within that shape and it's no different really because in this lemon now with this lemon i've got to fit it into that envelope so i hope you see the the logic and um the actual um ellipsoid shape of this one is almost like a flying saucer or a plate <laughs> really is very thin. So my advice on that is as you're drawing this, remember it has a line of symmetry or something similar. This time it's flat on the table, so that line is flat. So it now looks like the top of a screw. Got a slot running through the middle. And it's almost like a fish shape or a cigar shape or something like that. But Curve at the ends, make it more rounded. It, that's the ellipsoid shape. Some of the most difficult shapes, so many people struggle with the ellipsoid concepts. And now we can copy that curve there for the curve of the ellipsoid shape touching the table there. So it's parallel. And then when I erase the frame, I will be left with the lemon slice or the shape of a lemon slice, at least. And there it is. What you'll also start to notice is suddenly you're drawing because of these ellipsoid shapes and the way they tilt and tip towards or away from each other. Because you've explained them in scale, in proportion in the right placement now it suddenly feels three-dimensional just from an out from an outline which is an incredibly powerful aspect of good drawing so if you're getting that effect well done you have good outline drawing it is doing what it's supposed to do which is usually about nine tenths of the effect I say that because obviously it's just a concept. It's not really, I can't give you evidence to say what percentage of the outline is the art or the effect of the art. But I'll just go on from that to say that if you get this part wrong, it wouldn't matter how well you render it, the, the effect will be lost. So, this is how this is why it's so important to get this step correct. Now I am giving you one of the most challenging things, which is to try to get these ellipsoid shapes in perspective. And if you can crack this, you can apply this knowledge to cars in the street, to people in spaces, to almost anything. Um, and so still life is incredibly um, informative because it still deals with the principles, perspective, placement, proportion. All of those three, the three Ps are what we need in every artwork we do, visual artwork that is anything to do with realism. Right, well, um, we're nearly there. We've got one more slice to put on. Um, I'm just going to check you're all okay. I hope you're okay, Hillary. I know that we dropped out for whatever reason, and I hope you, you're okay. If there's anything that you need a, um, a little bit of advice with or explanation, please let me know, either in the chat or 
put your hand up on the thing yeah i can pause the recording and i can focus some time on you because i i know you've missed some of that but we are most of the way through we're still live we're going to put the next lemon section segment in rather so i'm going to clear off the drawings that i've done and then this one i'm going to um place on top of that one so this is a bit of a tricky one and you could use a rectangle again it's not too far off of a rectangle might be easier to do that because we've kind of got used to this idea, I hope. But this rectangle tilts over slightly. So we have to put it on a tilt. And therefore, as I put this line through, I'm conscious that it needs to be around about 14 minutes past the hour. So there we are, 14 minutes past the hour. And I'm also conscious that the box itself is very close to this lemon on the left. The box that I'm drawing cuts over a little bit of the lemon on the ground, two thirds of it perhaps at the top. I'm also conscious that there is a space between this segment and the round lemon there. And therefore, if I can get all of those spatial issues sorted in that rectangle, I think I've got a good chance. So there you go. The most important thing I think is that tilt. It is 14 minutes past the hour. And then once we've got that, then we establish where the actual ellipsoid shape begins. And I would say it is around about two thirds of the way up that along the box. So now I've got this little box here. I separate two thirds up or round about that or two fifths down, something like that. And then I'm going to draw my ellipsoid shape within that. And it's so thin, it's almost like a little fish without a tail it's just a little curving shape that's the easiest way i know of describing that and then if i clear the guides you you'll notice that because it's a sliced lemon it's sliced on that rounded form so it's going to have this angle here rather than a square edge. So that's why here you're seeing these uh, edges are sort of chamfered outwards slightly before it returns this full circ circumference around to the other side. Now, depending on the skill of the person slicing the lemon, of course, you might have a slightly irregular thickness and it, it does so happen that this one is thinner on the left hand side and slightly thicker on the right so you can even bring that sort of a difference into the still life and it makes sense not only on the eye but to anybody who's questioning what they're looking at they'll be able to think oh yeah that has been cut in such a manner that the uh and it's just a very small subtlety that, in a way, is evidence to more um, control in your drawing. You're really thinking about subtleties. So there we are. Now, the knife. <laughs> I'm not particularly uh, keen on knives in paintings, but because of the, you know, there's an obvious symbolism, but there is another issue with this knife. Its position is leading out of the frame that way, which isn't the best way. If it was coming the other way, perhaps, 
maybe pointing this way or that way, it would probably be better, but it is what it is. So I'm going to draw it as it is because it's there, but I just wanted to point that out that it could have been handled better. I can see why it's kind of like that, but it's not ideal. So you could leave it out if you so wish. So anyway, the knife is, is a rectangle in its envelope, like I'm trying to establish here. Um, and it's tilt at the moment. It's in this bottom quadrant on the left. It's got a little bit of distance between it and that lemon. And the tilt, I would say, you could look at it as 18 minutes past, something like that. Or what do you think would that be? That would be about 12 minutes, 13 or 14 minutes too, or something like that. Anyway, whatever you take it, I'm taking it as 18 minutes past. Seeing where it cuts over the line. So this this will help. It's very close to the center of that lemon there. That's where the handle goes to. And the blade, you, you could go a little bit longer or shorter, and I don't think anyone would notice. But I think if we want to get it right, it's about a third over from the left on that bottom square. So there's the parameters. And there it is, that's my, my box to place that in. And then once I've got that box established, I've already drawn a line up here. It's about two fifths for blade and three fifths for handle. Once you have that, then it's just a case then of drawing, he says, those shapes. Um, the handle has a curvature to it because it's a fruit knife, I think. And maybe a bit more rounded at the end. And the blade, well, with the blade, let the um, the projection of the line of the rectangle guide the top part of the blade as it comes out and then let it curve down or tilt down slightly about halfway in that box, that line there. And then you curve back again to the handle, something like that. And there you've got it. You've got your... Um, something very close to what we're looking at. And there we are. Then you just check, does that feel about right? Um, if not, tilt it a little bit one way or the other till it feels it's sitting on the table. The shadow will help. And I'm going to, in a moment, give you some time to get to there, but in a moment, I'm going to show you the shadow, the value map. I'm going to show you um, two value maps this evening. I'm going to show you um, a five value map for the rendering and a three value map, just to give us an idea of what we're dealing with in terms of shadow and light play, because that's quite interesting on this, because sometimes with very bright, subject matter like lemons which are yellow and bright I've got an orange it's quite bright as well and this blue is not particularly dull either so when you've got those kind of bright primary and secondary colors it can be difficult to locate shadows so using the value map makes 
good sense. The good news is when you've got very bright subject matter, usually you don't have to render too, diff, uh, too hard to get the shadow value because if it was a very dark object in a very dark space, we would be rendering all night. But tonight, hopefully, it's not going to be such a difficult task. Right, I'm going to share the, share, uh, the value map. Once I find it. Oh no, that's the wrong one. Here we go. Just getting it to scale for you. Okay, hopefully now you can see the value map. So the shadows, uh, this is the five value map. Not so good for the shadows because it can be a bit confusing. So I'll just find the three value map. Yeah, that's the three value map. This is a much better way of seeing the shadows because sometimes too much information can confuse. So here we go. So that's a three value map. And for the lemon, as I tried to explain earlier, the, vet, the, the lemon's going into shadow here. You clearly see its light side. This is all in the shadow. And then it will join the cast shadow. So form shadow will eventually emerge outwards as a cast shadow or it becomes cast shadow, especially with a, a low light angle like this one is coming in at that sort of an angle. Um, so there's the shadow on the lemon there that goes out to there. It's quite long, stretches quite long um, because the, the light is low. Same here. In this one, the actual inside of the sliced lemon is in the shadow as well and that stretches out behind that lemon and back again to there the lemon that's sitting on top of the the slice that's sitting on top of the other slice it's turning up to the light just a bit so only one half of the side is in shadow that's straightforward enough but that one side of that shadow also uh, joins in with the form shadow inside the slice of the next lemon. So that joins. And then there's a little gap of light, but then we see the shadow shape there from that sliced lemon. The big round side viewed lemon it's almost like a moon. You can see its shadow. You can't really see much of its cast shadow because it's behind this fellow here. But anyway, it's there somewhere, but we don't need to worry about it because we don't see it. And then the knife, well, it has a bright yet orange handle. So that's all in shadow, but to there. And then it joins the cast shadow there. The blade is not actually in shadow, and this is an interesting observation, but it's black. 
<laughs> Why is that? Well, because of its perspective or the way it's sitting, it's reflecting the dark above, the dark of the studio. So that's why it's black. It's actually reflecting the shadow behind it. And that's put the power of um, reflective materials. They can reflect light or shadow, sometimes both. And the jug, which is pretty much three quarters in shadow, it's pretty straightforward when you look at it like that, therefore. It's just a bit of light on that side there and the rest of it. Oh, and a little slither of light, a little bit of rim light there. The rest goes into shadow. So I hope that explains what we're looking at to some degree. Um, it will make more sense as we go from object to object. It's very difficult to recall all of it in one go. So my advice would be, always just start with the biggest object and its shadows and then gradually whittle away till you have the smaller objects. And the other thing is shadow shapes, sometimes as we just saw there, they join other shadows from other objects. They sort of unify. This is called unifying the darks, which is a phenomena that um, artists use to make more sense of that map, because otherwise it can be really complicated in the first instance. So I'm gonna help you by going through one by one. Hopefully you're seeing the color version again. I'm gonna start with the big object and I'm going to draw its shadow. Um, and I'm going to make you aware of some anom anomalies which can occur with shadows on light objects and, and reflective objects too. But that's the um, terminator of the light into shadow. We call that the terminator line. That's the main shadow uh, boundary. So we draw that in. It's about halfway in the line of symmetry where we started. And notice that little step, this little funny step here at the neck where it curves downwards. As we go downwards into the jug's shape, it then curves towards the table. Okay. Now the anomaly is we start to see reflected moments within the shadow. You see the reflection of the orange, uh, the lemon, sorry. You also see the reflection here of the handle catching light. Well, it is there. You could draw it in now, but I would um, just say, hold on for a moment. It may not be necessary for this example that we're doing tonight. Um, I'm also going to put that little bit of rim lighting there at the top of the handle and on the top of the spout. There's definitely some light there. And then down at the bottom, you'll see there's an, a cast shadow borrowed from the other objects, sort of sitting on the, the base there. So I just draw some little abstract shapes if you want, I can just draw them on there first. And they are of varying, varying um, depth, those shadows. Some of them are darker, some of them are lighter, but they're all still shadows. <clears throat> okay, so there's, there's the jug part dealt with. I'll come back to it. Now I'm going to the Terminator on the lemon and its shadow cast across the table. And now you'll become aware of another shadow behind it. Now, you could either join those two shadow shapes together. Start, I'm going to start with the lemon shape, though, here. There's a little S shape here. That will be fine. And then as it then meets the table, you see it sort of curves out ever so slightly as it sort of tapers off to the edge of the composition. But you've already noticed that other shadow line, which is from the jug. Now, 
for the speed, for ease of use in this still life, I am going to join and take an executive decision. I'm joining this shadow shape into that one. You probably saw, though, there were some small slithers of light, but, and they were probably about there. You can put them in or not. It's up to you. It won't have a detrimental effect on the overall composition either way, as long as you include them. Um, right, so moving on to the next lemon, it's this one here. And that stretches over and it joins in with our jug. That's the one that's casting that shadow there. It's an awkward one, but it's quite interesting. So it curves down onto the table, quite thin. And notice that the shadows themselves become ellipsoid in nature. And there we go. So there's my cast shadow as it wraps over the, over the table. And then it joins up onto the jug. Interesting. And you'll have already noticed that there is another shadow just behind and underneath there, which is coming from that lemon. And so I just join that in. And I'll just join all of those as a dark. And it, again, just like what we did over here, it will not have a detrimental effect. You'll see it will still work. Just for the exercise. If I was doing a painting, I would probably choose to show all of those little slithers of light because it just uh, gives a bit more interest. Now, moving to this lemon, um, there is a shadow at the side here. It goes across the table behind the lemon slice. It's like a coin. Stretches behind it, touches underneath that other lemon. And there we are. But I want to take your attention back to the lemon itself because it is also in shadow here. It's turned away from the light. It's not catching any light. So all of that top plane, Although it's not a very dark shadow, admittedly, because it's lemon um, fruit, it's in shadow. Then we move on to the last, oh no, to the coin. That has a shadow like that. And it does actually cast a small amount of shadow on the other fruit section there. which itself dips in and out of the light somewhat. So some of that is form shadow and some of it's the cast shadow from the slice above. So it's, it's an interesting relationship that those two are having in the picture. And last but not least on the lemon front is that line there halfway down this section, this segment, and it stretches out in a curvilinear manner around there. And there it is. So now I have all my shadows of my lemons and my jug. Just need the shadow of the knife. Um, I mentioned that it has a, it's got a very thin shadow line here. That's called the occlusion shadow and that joins into that shadow that's the cast shadow. So the occlusion shadow is literally a dark line underneath the handle, and then the handle itself casts a little curvy shaped shadow, like so. Um, there is some kind of a shadow up here, but I think we'll just infer it later because it doesn't really have a we don't know whether it's a reflection in the wood or whether it's actually 
it's a soft edged shadow, so it sort of blurs out. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop there, see if everybody's okay, see how you're doing, and then we can go into shading, shading this uh, to bring out the form, because now we've got the composition in perspective. Certainly feels like it. Um, it's now ready to render. So I'm going to pause again the video. Right. So hopefully you've all managed to get to this point. So what I have just done there is I've put a middle value tone throughout the, the um, shadow shapes and the table itself, which is wood has a middle value. Um, so that means now I can start to add a darker accent on the shadows on the table. So either I press a little bit harder, which I wouldn't uh, advise, or I change my pencil to a slightly darker version. Just so happens I have a 4B or a 2B would do, and I can now patch and I'm going in the same direction, but this time a little bit more slowly with a little bit more consideration for where those dark values really are. You see, that's quite effective, that 4B. Um, notice I've missed a few of my middle value shapes, so I just quickly pop those in. So if you forget, a, you know, an area of a step, don't worry about it. As soon as you notice it, go in and fill that in. Now, with the variegation in some of the shadow shapes, for example, this one, it tends to go a little bit lighter as the penumbra comes out, which makes sense. The more light that's coming across is likely to bounce maybe off the jug into that space there and lighten it somewhat so bear that in mind it is possible to make that consideration as you go some people just do it all the same and then erase it later whichever you're comfortable with i like to save a bit of time personally so i just make it a bit darker as i go or lighter and then i move on to the next consideration and it's always this way really if you wish to keep your artwork orderly and logical um, you don't necessarily have to even consider the next step once you've got the process and what I mean by that is it becomes quite mechanical um, so you can relax put music on have a cup of tea Enjoy it. it. You don't even have to think about it once you've got the process. Um, and so this is what I would call the dark accent. I could put this in right at the end, but with these very light objects in shadow, i.e. lemons, it just makes more sense to put them on now. And you can see that it already gives my drawing at this stage, the, which is still early really, it gives it more of a feeling of solidity, gives it a feeling of um, form, like a cartoon. It's got the essential contrasts already within it. Notice I put the dark on that um, knife blade because it's reflecting the dark behind. It looks out of place now because it doesn't have the context of the dark background. So if I wanted to keep it that dark, I'd have to put that background in. I'm not going to do it in this video, but I could. And I can put that little slither of light in if I feel it's necessary, which I just did. So what's the next stage? Well, the next stage is to now start to work in the lights. Right, so how does that work? Well, if we remember, the light is coming from the left at a very, quite a low angle, slightly this way, 
from the back towards the front. Um, so all of this here is getting quite a bit of light. So this is where I change pencil yet again. I'm going to go to my HB. And if you do have a H or 2H, make that ready as well. So I've got my HB. Now at the uh, terminator line here, I just put in, I'm just testing the water as it were, trying to imagine you are um, a plasterer. There, that's a good analogy. Now, you know, the plaster, he comes in and he puts some plaster on the wall. And then if he finds a little thing that he has to smooth, he smooths it. So if I'm adding a bit of plaster to this part, I want to curve it around. I have to touch my tone in and just blur that edge. I want that edge to kind of blur. So if you've got a very dark line there, it's, it's going to take you a while, but... It's not impossible. So I'm just blurring into that line. All the way down. Like I'm zipping the light tone towards the dark tone, but it's got to be very close value. You know, it's almost the same, almost. And then as I stretch out into the curve of what is the jug, I will allow this to get slightly lighter. I hope that makes sense because what I am doing in effect, I'll show you now. Imagine I was to cut a slice of this jug. There it is there, the curvy slice. From here to here. There it is, that's a segment sliced out of this jug. The terminator would be there. So that's this. Middle value that I'm putting in. And then from that middle value, I'm turning towards a lighter tone. So this is the HB now, joins in. And it's like uh, gradually stretching outwards to the light. So as I render out to it, notice I'm getting less and less tone, hopefully. And then it just disappears, almost becomes white, almost. And then it turns again slightly towards the end back out to the darks. So, yeah, that's kind of in essence what I'm attempting to do, but instead of a little section like that, there we go. Instead of that little section there, it's the whole jug. So it's gonna take a bit of time. Now, I don't tend to do it as a diagonal this time. I just touch it in as tone. And I try my best to find a bridge tone where they two will meet, but slightly lighter on my side of the, on the light side. And then as I start to go out into the lights, I gradually let off the pressure a little bit and it's gonna get a little bit lighter, but consistently within that curve. Now that's the bit that is a struggle for most beginners, but conceptually, if you can hold on to the thought, you are literally halfway there because it is really, concept that you can start to master while you're rendering like so same up here the spout's a bit awkward because it kind of curves that way and then it goes up into that little funnel shape which don't worry about it you just build out to it 
and then a little bit more tone, like so, in that little pinched area. And then weld that, like the plaster wood, that bit to that bit. It's starting to uh, starting to work. Hope yours is too. So that's my HB. When the HB gets a little bit heavy going and it's too dark, I use the two H then to fill in the next light section. So now, as you put the H or the 2H, and you'll notice it doesn't make half the amount of tone. So don't press hard with it. Let it do its thing. It's like um, when you're shading like this, I think of it like, a, remember the old record players, the stylus? It's like a, it's like a stylus. You're, you're allowing it to gently bring out the music without forcing it. Otherwise, you damage the stylus. There's no, there's no point to rushing it because it's really like the tortoise and the hare. The hare is going to lose because it just cannot fathom the subtlety that is needed. with the rush. So yeah, I think it's um, gradually helping. And then we have another trick up our sleeves in a moment, because once you get to that terminator line, you'll start to see as the two sort of dissolve, that the contrast should really get a little bit darker at Terminator. Now, that's why I've got the five value map for you, because the five value map shows you much more. So where's that one gone? This is the five value map. I'm going to share that with you now because this is the next piece of necessary information. So on the five value map, you can see that just behind the shadow line, there is a heavier accent. That's the that's really where the light really starts to disappear. That's the terminator. On this particular object, there's more than just one. You've got it on the handle as well. Um, I thought I'd share that with you because it's going to help us with the shading to give you more form. So I'm going to get shot of that one now. And we carry on. So what does that mean then? Well, it means that with my 2B or my 4B, it doesn't really matter. I'd go with a 2B, to be honest, it's gentle. I can now just pass the uh, blurry line that you've created there, just behind it, go a little bit darker and weld it into the tones around it, both sides of the, um, the light and the dark. Weld it in because when you put this in, you're suddenly going to see more form yet again. So th this is commonly where the sketch will probably finish. Now, I do realize that if you wanted to do this jug really well, which you might want to, I don't know. Remember, it is a drawing exercise. It doesn't have to be a finished work of art in the gallery or something. But if you wanted to put it in the gallery, 
you'd have to then draw the reflection of the lemon and the other subtleties that you're seeing, the reflections. But this is a good, a good place to leave it, where we just put this shadowy line. And you can see that there is a sort of a wider push out there where the lemon starts to reflect into it. So I'm just shading out to there. And my jug starts to now feel more alive, which is good. And I just bring some of that tone under the lemon. And just to finish off, I will render that tone into this tone. So I just joined that darker line, that um, terminates a shadow, I just let it join in with the rest just by shading out, branching out to the other tone and letting it seamlessly merge. Okay, now the handle also has that dark shadowy line, so I'll just put that in quickly. Once you've got the idea, you, you can sort of thrust forward and make those subtleties known. And then once again, shade that gently into the surrounding tone, like it's morphing into the tone. And in that way, your drawing will start to get a more believable form from such simple measures. So what we've really done is we've utilized the value map. We've looked at the shadow map and we've rendered to the light. And then we've come back to add an extra depth of shadow. Now I could go into more form there, um, but this is not the week for it because we've got quite a bit to do with these lemons. So once you've got your, your um, jug to that state, well done. We're going to move on to the lemon. Now the lemon, we, we've specified quite a bit of it. We've got the, um, the shadow. Now we're going to move again to the light. So same again, if you like to just tidy up the edge a little bit, sometimes it's better to erase the guideline. You remember you have a guideline that you shaded to, just, you can erase that. And that makes it so much easier now to use my HB to render a slightly lighter tone next to it. Blurring it in, getting a bit fuzzy at my eyes at this time of the evening. And then you just keep going outwards, stretching outwards as if you were knitting the tone, but it's ever so slightly lighter now, it's getting lighter as we get closer to the um, end of the lemon, which is catching the light. But I go back and forth a little bit, adding a bit more tone. You see, I'm sort of trying to render that form. And then as I get to the front of the lemon, it is catching more light. So what I'll do there is I'll skip into using 2H. So the 2H is the lightest pencil I have. And it doesn't do very much at all when you put it on. It's like the stylus, it's very gentle. We just keep adding a little bit more tone and then a presto. There's usually a bit more tone underneath as well, there. And now my lemon starts to have some form, but it hasn't got the terminator. And just like the jug has a terminator, the lemon does too, closest to the light. So I, I pick up my 2B. I'm going to go very gentle because it's not as dark as you think, because yellow 
literally an orange into yellow will look dark because it's primary that's the lightest, most intense color. So it is very close to the white. It's very light. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just putting a small amount of that tone, gradually building it up. And then when I feel that, yeah, I think that's enough tone, I'll then shade that and let it dissolve gradually in tone to the rest of the shadow shape. Because the shadow is already expressed by the middle value, it probably won't need a lot of tone. You see that as it goes back. So there's, there's my um, shaded lemon. Looking okay. I mean, of course, I could work on it more and more and get it feeling more like the lemon. But as soon as you've got it feeling and it, you know, you're happy that it's got a form of a lemon, then you can move on to the next one. So I'm happy with that. Um, where to next? Well, I'm going to go to the next biggest one again. It's always easier for me to do that. I've got my, I've established my middle value which is the shadow tone mostly. Then I'm going to take my eraser and just erase the guideline. That guideline is difficult to weld into, to render into. So I'm going to get rid of it. And then take my HB and start to <laughs> knit again, like a little spider. I'm trying to join this tone to that, a little bit lighter. Now I have to remember that this is a circular form and there's a little dimple thing. So I, I branch out around that circular thing, that dimple. And then once I got that sort of specified as my tone, then I go lighter again as it sort of turns this way this time to the light. So this one's not going to take much at all. I, I, I'll speed through this one because I've got the HB there. Now I need the 2H. Because I'm turning to the light really quickly. especially this upper quadrant of the shape, that's definitely got more light. And that dimple's got quite a bit of light. And then to finish that off, now I've got the shadow and the lights roughly in. I'll take my 2B again and go into the Terminator to give it more form. This time, I'm going to start at the edge of the other fruit there, because that's quite a bit darker down there. And then I'm going to stretch upwards to that dimple. And there's a, there's a like a little V shape there, like an indentation that. Seems to give the lemon more form. And then there's a bounce light within it. So you have to be doubly careful on that dimple thing. Good luck with that. That is quite tricky. But you just sort of go from the dark back out in towards a middle tone. And then it goes dark again, like a little ring around Saturn, that sort of thing. And then you're stretching out again towards the shadow tones of the fruit which are capturing some bounced light. So you don't really have to work too hard to express that. And then this part of the fruit turns down and of course is bouncing less light and capturing more shadow. So there we go, as it turns down, it gets darker again. So there's that.
lemon. Hopefully that's working. So I've got two lemons. Now it's going to be interesting because we have a lemon that's sliced. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, um, start off with the, um, what do you call it? The, the fleshy side, not the internal bits. So we just render to the light. It's smaller, so but even so, it's still there. So there's my light side. And I just render gradually from the shadow to the light. Won't take but a moment, but it still has to be done. And it's the same method, just in case you were wondering. HB into 2H in the lights. And then we get to the pith part, which is really very interesting. I would go in with the HB and perhaps just divide some segments, if you wish, through the center, like a little guideline for yourself, almost like a bit like the Union Jack or something, you know, lots of segments. And then choose a triangle, which your divisions should give you, and just shade that little triangle with a bit of tone. And you'll see straight away it starts to build what is a feeling of a segment. And then leave a gap because the pithy stuff is white, so it is very light. And this bit's not so much a difficulty, really. Once you've got that strategy, you kind of, yeah. And then instead of sometimes having a light gap between the pithy parts, I think I'll just zoom in on that so you can see what I'm attempting to do. There we go. You can see I've made these segments and between the segments, it's clean. And then as those segments sort of turn away from the light a little bit, they don't capture so much light. I'll just put a bit of tone in there. And then I'll just um, in places emphasize a darker line where the segments seem to be moving towards a shadow. So that's my strategy there. It's not the only way to do it. There's many ways, but that's a, that is a working way to do it, which will definitely give you the effect of the lemon. So try that and HB or a 2H, HB will do it quickly if you can get your values up to speed quickly. If you want to take it slower, HB will get you there. But there, there it is. That's my feel. That's my lemon. Feels like a lemon on the eye at least. And then people will know. They'll go, oh, still life with lemons. Moving on to this one, similar job as well. We've got the shadow, remember, down here on the side of the fruit. Just clean out your lights so that you've got something to render into. Remember the outline of the shadow shape. Just dispense with that if you can. And then shade in with your HB, turning gradually the curve towards the light. Almost there. This time the light is up there, less light down there. So it's not always the same. You have to be a little bit careful because these fruits are aiming slightly different trajectories from the light. But that seems to work. And now 
Oh, I'll make that little dark shape between the two fruits a little bit darker. And now I'm going to go into the fruity bit in the inside of it. Now, you'll notice that it is a shadowy shape, so it's quite a bit of tone in there, turning away from the light. Even on the light rim, which is sort of a pithy color, white. And then again, you can start to divide this into some segments. There's not too many that you can see, to be honest. But you can start to draw them like that, little segments, and then shade those like little pizza shapes. Just a little bit of tone, see that? And then leave a little gap between the next one so that there's a lighter spell of tone between the segments of your lemon. And that should give you the appearance of segments. And then later on, as you start to shade around the, the clock as it were you will see that the segments kind of dissolve into the shadow so you don't really necessarily have to do more than that but you might want to leave a lighter central bit you know that little bit that joins it all perhaps and there we are so i've got my um, next segment done. Right, I'm going to zoom out a little bit because I think you got the idea now what I was doing. Let's see the whole thing. Right, now we're nearly there. We've got these two segments to do down here. They're pretty much the same deal. So start off on the shadowy, got your shadowy side there. Erase the that guideline, we don't need it. It was there as a conceptual boundary. There is no real boundary. It's just dark and light. Pick up your HP, touch into it, gradually dissolve the tone as it reaches towards the light. Melting away into light. That tone disappearing. And then this bit's very, it, it seems more complicated than it is. You're just going to put a little bit of circular tone into that, leaving a central bit that's a little bit lighter. And it will probably, at that point, start to feel and look like, the, you know, the context of being surrounded by lemons will inform the eye to what it is we're looking at. So you won't have to put as much in as you, you might think. So don't worry about that. And then the same with this one. We're seeing a bit more, to be fair. You're seeing the sort of rim, which is light. So I just put a little boundary for the light rim. I'll reserve that. And then I'll just shade out towards the light and then put a little segment in wherever I see it. There might be a little line, like a little, almost moments on a clock. You can just about see them. And then it looks pretty much like an orange, a lemon seg uh, segment. Slice. That's good. So we've got that. And now finally, the knife. So we've got all of our lemon segments. We've got all of, we've got the jug pretty much. The knife, well, it's got a, two little dark spots. You've got to decide, am I going to do the background? It's up to you. I'm just going to put a bit of tone 
it is orange, so that's the secondary color. So it's a middle value. So I put a little bit of light middle value on the handle. Up the top there, it's a bit lighter. And then down below, I render it a little bit darker until it meets the shadow. See that? And you'll see there's a um, bit of a reflected highlight in the form of the handle coming from the studio lighting, which is great. That will help. So I'll put that in now. I use my eraser and I'll just draw back some highlights into the handle of the, um, the knife. Now, I did mention, if you're gonna do the background, you can have that knife blade looking as it is in the photograph. But it's reflecting the dark of the background. And if you don't put the dark of the background in, it doesn't make logical sense on the eye. It won't read. So my answer to that is this. Erase that. Bring it back to a light. and make what's around it slightly darker. So I just render a little bit more tone onto the table here. Because it's your painting, uh, drawing, sorry. And you can change the silhouette shape. It is a silhouette. So it can be a dark silhouette or a light silhouette. In nature, that's what happens. We get a counter change. Um, so I just make that darker along the blade there instead of lighter and lighter where it was darkest. And now it makes sense, apart from this hovering slice, <laughs> which was a bit of fun. Um, and if you're not doing the background, this is a good idea as well. You can put your highlight in, sorry, you can put your uh, line in the uh, edge of your picture and then just render to that. So I put a bit of tone to it. This saves you having to do the background, by the way. That's all I'm trying to do to help you with. And then once you've got a bit of tone in there, as you can see, it's helping a little bit. Then render that tone into this tone. This is where you get to practice your rendering. See if you can really get it nice and smooth and transitioning nicely. And look, it just gives the table a bit more depth. And you can, uh, if you want to, you can keep exploring that same idea until you get a very dark edge to that table. But as you can see, that's enough, really. That will work. Um, so there we are. That's, um, that was today's lesson. If I wanted to take it a little bit, bit, a little bit further, I would just make my dark accents on the shadows, because some of those shadows, as, as I mentioned previously, they change their value. They, they kind of go from very, very dark to not so dark, um, especially near what's called the occlusion shadow, which is the bit where the object meets the table, where there's no light there, for example, on the lemon. That can be very dark. And then just to give your drawing a little bit more of a feeling of depth, just gradually see that shade from one tone into the next. But once you start doing this kind of effect, so that's what it is, you'll have to do it literally <laughs> everywhere. 
So even on that knife blade, it needs an occlusion shadow. Very thin, dark line. And then it gets darker towards us and then lighter again. Anyway, I think we did it. We've got what we wanted this week. Well done. I'm going to stop the share now and um, stop the video and just have a little look at what you've done before I go. And uh, hope you've enjoyed that.